All right, if we want to begin. Good afternoon, everyone. Uh, my name is Amanda Farias. I am the officer of Western Michigan University. Today, we are starting this first webinar in celebration. Can we? Um, good afternoon, everyone. I'm Amanda Farias, the liaison officer of Western Michigan University. Today, we are starting this first webinar in celebration of, of our new partnership with the Federal University of Pará and Western Michigan University. To give us this start, I would like you to introduce this professor, Dr. Marilia Nazaré de Oliveira. Uh, he's a full professor of the Federal University of Pará, PhD in Linguistics. Here in which he is the head of the International Relations Office of University Federal Europa. And Paulo Zagallo Mello is an associate provost for global education at Western Michigan University, overseeing the Heinz Institute for Global Education and additional comprehensive internationalization towards across campus. He was also associate provost for global education, director of global engagement office, and associate professor of educational leadership at the University of Montana. Professor Maria and Professor Paulo. Yes, thank you very much for being here uh, this afternoon. Glad to see you, to meet you. It's really a pleasure to welcome this webinar uh, and all people involved with this. This activity is held by Federal University of Pará and Western Michigan University. Thank you all professors that are here. Um, I would like to thank Professor Paulo Zagallo and your team, and my one team here at Federal University of Pará, by our uh, strategic vision, disponibility, and presence to give life to our agreement. Uh, I wish our communities can share a lot this virtual time together. Thank you. Thank you so much, Professor Marília Ferreira. Uh, boa tarde a todos. Um, uh, meu nome é Paulo Zagallo Mello, como a Amanda referiu. Uh, so, Associate Provost for Global Education aqui na Western Michigan University. E é um prazer ter a oportunidade de estar aqui com a Federal do Pará e também a oportunidade de falar um pouco com a minha língua materna, que é uma oportunidade que eu não tenho muito no Michigan. Um, eu, como já devem ter adivinhado pela pronúncia, eu sou de Portugal. Portanto, não falo aquele português tão bonito como o do Brasil, mas, um, tenho, mas tenho uma, um, um prazer uh, imenso e, e uma honra enorme de estar aqui com a Federal do Pará um, e de estar participando nesse webinar para um, a, a parceria da Western Michigan com a Federal do Pará. Um, Nós temos aqui hoje uh, um dos nossos professores, uh, de, hoje estamos aqui uh, com um enfoque na, na Psicologia, uh, a Universidade uh, Western Michigan e a Federal do Pará são universidades muito fortes nessa área e então vamos falar de como, uh, como podemos uh, uh, aproveitar esses recursos e esse conhecimento e, e pesquisa que temos nas nossas duas universidades. Um, essa colaboração começou com o Pedro Soares, que está aí também no, no webinar, que foi um Fulbright Scholar aqui na Western Michigan University no ano letivo passado, portanto, 2019-2020. E eu tive a oportunidade de 
estar com o Pedro algumas vezes durante uh, e falar com o Pedro, reunirmos com o Federal do Pará pela primeira vez, enquanto o Pedro estava aqui ainda na Western Michigan. Portanto, eu agradeço um, ao Pedro Soares todo o trabalho que ele fez para desenvolver contato com a Federal do Pará e começar a iniciar o trabalho para a futura parceria. Pedro, muito obrigado, sempre foi essencial uh, nesse contato e esse foi binário, é um resultado também de todo o trabalho que você fez aqui na Western Michigan e depois também de regressar à sua Federal do, do Pará, não é? Uh, so I don't want to take too much time from today's webinar, um, but I did have to take the opportunity to address the participants in my native language, as I was explaining, I don't have many opportunities to do that here in Kalamazoo, Michigan. Um, but I'd um, hand off the virtual mic now to Pedro, um, who as I explained, this is the result, this webinar is the result of conversations we had with Pedro and obviously the work he did with our psychology department while here in Kalamazoo, Michigan. Um, so it's a, it's a pleasure to be here to see um, this uh, fruitful Fulbright um, scholarship that uh, Pedro had resulting in, in um, conversations that can lead into um, even more fruitful um, collaborations in the near future. So, Pedro, the mic is yours, and I'd like to thank everyone, uh, and especially on the Western Michigan side, Dr. Mallet and Dr. Pauling for being here today and, and taking time from their uh, busy schedules to uh, address our participants and collaborate with uh, Federal do Pará. So, thank you, everyone. Marilia, thank you very much for also your leadership on this. And Pedro, now the mic is yours. Okay, thank you, Dr. Paulo Bagalina. Um, uh, again, I am I'm Pedro Suarez, and I'm a doctoral student at the graduate program in behavior theory and research here at Universidad Federal de Pará, Federal University of Pará, and I'll be hosting today's webinar. Uh, we will have four speakers to discuss the future of behavior analysis as an international movement. Um, so let me present to you how we are scheduled for today. Uh, the first speaker will be Dr. Alan Paul, the professor of psychology at Western Michigan University. The following speaker will be Dr. Francois Tenru, who is a professor of behavioral theory and research at the Universidad Federal Para, Federal University of Para. Next, we'll have Dr. Dick Malan, Professor Emeritus of Psychology at Western Michigan University. And last but not least, uh, Dr. Thiago Costa, Professor of Organizational Psychology at Universidad Federal Pará, Federal University of Pará. So let us get started. Um, as mentioned, uh, our first speaker will be Dr. Paul, the Professor of Psychology at WNU. And he has conducted research and done conceptual work in several areas, uh, including behavioral pharmacology, applied behavior analysis, uh, learning processes, and gender issues. He has received awards from WNU, West Virginia University, uh, California Association for Behavior Analysis, American Psychological Association, and uh, Association for Behavior Analysis International. So, good afternoon, Dr. Pauling. Uh, the screen and the microphone is now yours. Thank you very much, Pedro. It's a pleasure and an honor to participate in today's webinar. Uh, I really appreciate uh, having the, the opportunity to talk with everyone, and I'd like to thank the people who invited me to do so. And also, I'd like to thank everyone who's listening. I hope this is the start of a, a long and fruitful relationship between our universities. Now, my topic is, will international partnerships help behavior analysis to survive and prosper? And the answer is absolutely yes. That may be self-evident, but perhaps not. So why do I say that? On what basis do I make that claim? Well, 
One reason is my personal experience. From the time I was a little boy, I wanted to travel. And fortunately, Dr. Poling, I think I think you have this WebEx window opened in two sc screens, and that's why we're hearing the feedback. open on two different screens so we're getting a lot of feedback when you're um, trying to speak Can you hear me? we're still getting the feedback do you have webex open on another in another tab So uh, I, I think I'm gonna uh, pass the screen to the to our next uh, guest speaker. So. Um, I uh, will follow the follow the order. So I'm not seeing Dr. Zygmala here, so I'm going uh, directly to uh, Dr. Francois I'm going to, I'm going to briefly uh, present him uh, and introduce him to, to our webinar today. So, um, uh, okay, Dr. Pauling. Hey, Dr. Pauling. Is Dr. Yes. Pauling back? I'm back, I hope. Okay, and we can hear you perfectly now, Alan. So go ahead. Okay, I, I apologize. I'm not sure what happened. I just exited the meeting and got back in. But let me pick up where I left off. I'm really honored to have a chance to speak with you. And I believe that international partnerships are key uh, to the survival and the growth of behavior analysis. Well, why do I make that case? Well, I make it in part based on my personal experiences. From the time I was small, I 
wanted to travel, wanted to learn about other people and uh, try to help make the world better. And my position at Western Michigan University has afforded me an opportunity to do that to a greater extent than I could ever have imagined. And I'll give you just a few examples. Early on in my career, I took sabbatical leave and traveled to New Zealand, largely because I wanted to see New Zealand. But while I was there, I established professional relationships with two people, uh, Mary Foster and Bill Temple. And those two became invaluable friends and colleagues. Uh, they taught me a great deal. They taught me about uh, quantitative analysis of behavior. Uh, we did a lot of matching research. Uh, we worked together in the area of behavioral economics. They introduced me to an area of research I'd never even heard about, and that's using behavior analysis to improve the welfare of farmed animals. Uh, I started working with uh, Bill and Mary more than 30 years ago, and uh, that relationship continued to be fruitful until Bill passed away and, and Mary retired. And now, one of my former students, uh, Tim Edwards, has joined the faculty at the university where Bill and Mary were employed. And I continue to work with Tim. He's doing work using dogs to detect lung cancer in people and invasive aquatic species. And I hope to go to New Zealand to work with, with Tim. But the bigger international collaboration that's affected my career was work I uh, did for about a decade with colleagues uh, who work for APOPO, which is a, a Belgian NGO headquartered in Tanzania. And they use giant African palstrats, uh, Chrysidemes and Sorge, to find uh, explosive remnants of war and tuberculosis. And starting in 2008, uh, I worked with colleagues from all around the world, from several African countries, uh, European countries, uh, a couple South American uh, people, uh, some Asians, just a wide variety of people. And that was, I think, some of the best work I ever did. And those people taught me just, just a great deal. Now, I might mention that many of those people uh, weren't behavior analysts. They were in other areas. And I believe that, that we behavior analysts uh, can benefit ourselves and our discipline, not just by working with international behavior analysts, but by collaborating with a wide variety of people around the world. And my work at Apopo uh, gave me de facto evidence that, that that was the case. Just another personal example. Recently, uh, one of my former PhD students, Hugo Curiel, uh, introduced me to a colleague uh, from Mexico. And uh, the three of us with Emily Curiel completed a little project that, that I really enjoyed. It was related to gender issues. And I hope to continue that work. So uh, working with, with people from a number of different countries has really helped my career to move forward. It's allowed me to do things that I couldn't otherwise have done. And I'd like to think that combining my skills with the skills of these colleagues in various places around the world benefited them as well as me, and perhaps more importantly, our combined efforts, I truly believe, often benefited other people. The consumers of behavior analysis matter more than the practitioners of it. We ought to be making the world better. And I'd like to think that, that my international partners and I took some small step in that direction. But my faith in the value of international collaboration 
it doesn't reside just with my personal experiences. I've seen other people uh, do good things through international collaboration that they couldn't otherwise do. I'll give you an example close to home. Uh, my wife, uh, Crystal Earhart, is a professor of special education at Western Michigan University. And Crystal has worked off and on for quite some time with one of her former students uh, to deliver good educational services in Nicaragua. Uh, they've focused on students with developmental disabilities, but also on other students. And uh, they've, they've done some really good things. They've worked in resource poor areas and uh, helped a lot of students and a lot of families. So there are lots of examples of, of people working together internationally to do good things and advance the field. But I have, have reasons for valuing international collaboration beyond personal experiences, uh, direct or indirect. If you think about it, the problems that beset the world are universal. Think about COVID-19. It's a curse in Brazil. It's a curse in the United States. I mean, we share that. It's a bad situation. Lots of other countries are in the same boat, unfortunately. Look at global warming. Same oceans rising. Every country with a coastline being inundated. Or think about income inequality and the universally poor treatment of poor people. Those are problems that we all face. Every culture has people with developmental disabilities who have important needs. So we share challenges. And these challenges, by their very nature, can't be solved by people working within boundaries. If you think about viruses, they know no country boundaries. They don't distinguish. You know, you cross out of the United States into Mexico. No, it doesn't affect them. You know, border wall won't stop the virus. So if, if we're going to make progress in, in solving the big problems that are at our doorstep, we have to work together. And I believe that behavior analysis gives us some powerful tools to address those problems. If I didn't, I wouldn't be a behavior analyst. Now, the tools we have are not panaceas. It's not easy to solve big problems. But clearly, at least in some areas, we behavior analysts have, have done good things. I mean, perfect examples are work with people with developmental disabilities and a great value. And I believe that we can make similar inroads in other areas, although to do so, we might have to combine our efforts with uh, the people with other skill sets. And to a goodly extent, I believe that, that the applied interventions that are effective in one culture will also work in other cultures. The principles of behavior are universal. All human beings are affected by rules and by punishment and by reinforcement, and they all exhibit stimulus control. However, cultural variables, behavioral histories, influence how people act. And, and one thing I see of potential interest is working with colleagues in different countries to see whether interventions that are effective in one culture are similarly effective in other cultures. For instance, I can imagine uh, working uh, with, with one of you uh, to uh, try to get people to wear masks. We're doing uh, some work in, in, in the schools to get students with special needs to wear masks and to maintain social distancing. Just getting started, I hope it works. I don't know that it will. I would guess that if our procedures are effective in Kalamazoo, they would also be effective in Manaus, but I don't know that. And 
more two or more of us to work together, it would be a great thing. And think about showing the generality of an intervention that significantly increased mask wearing in Manaus and Kalamazoo and Bora Bora, Tanzania. Then you've shown generality. And that's worthwhile. So I think that, that I know that we can do a world of good if we work together, but it won't be easy. There are barriers. Money's a barrier, always a barrier. It always has been for me. You know, I'd love to invite all of you to come up to Kalamazoo and hang out, work with me, but I can't pay for that. I'd like to come to Brazil and work with you. Hell, I can't leave this country now. You know, I hope to someday, but, but I can't leave now. And, you know, I don't have the money really to, to do it. Maybe you know, I can hustle with that, but, but money's always a challenge. Fortunately, technology, unless you muck it up like I just did, uh, will let us interact, do things. I'm a bit of a Luddite, but I have faith in technology. It's, it's going to let us work together from a long way apart. But there are other barriers. Language is one. You know, I don't speak Portuguese. There's a way around that. People should learn multiple languages. If I look at the things I should have done in my life and didn't, becoming multilingual was one of them. I've really stressed with my kids. They need to learn more than English. And fortunately, in many countries, it's just a given that, that people do. So you can learn multiple languages. Translators, they're key. And of course, technology now is doing a fair job with with translation. So I think there are ways around the challenges. I'll close with another one, xenophobia. And more and more, and this to my way of thinking is horrible, I see nationalism emerging. You know, stay at home, everybody else is bad, it's evil out there, take care of yourself. Well, I don't abide with that view. Other people are typically scary and bad until you encounter them. Not to say that there isn't evil in the world, there is. But I'd like to believe that there's not very much of it in behavioral analysis. Well, I'll close with that. I'd be happy to partner with anybody who'd like to work with me. I, I think we should all throw our skills into the common pot and stir it up, and let's hope when we come out we've got something good for everybody. So that's my view. so much, Dr. Tom, for your talk. Uh, thank you again for accepting to participate and give your, your take on this uh, topic. Uh, Amanda has something to, to say before we continue, so I give this brief to Amanda now. Yeah, thank you, Pedro. Thank you, Dr. Pauling. It was uh, a very astonishing presentation and the claim that you made. Uh, uh, now I'm coming to all the audience to share that if you have any questions, you can email um, me on the, on the bottom of the YouTube, which is amanda.fadidas at wwh.edu, and you can address any question you have from all of these webinars. So in the end, we will read some of the questions and share with our speakers of today. Thank you. Um, Pedro? Okay. Thank you, um, Amanda. Thank you so yeah. much for the, the information. So let us continue. Um, Dr. Francois Dunot is our next speaker. He's a professor of behavioral theory and research at uh, USPA, University, Federal University of Pará. And he has conducted research and done conceptual work in several areas of behavioral science including philosophical and conceptual issues uh, 
of login processes and stimulus correlations. His conceptual work, his work on behavior analysis is considered one of the most inventive and original approaches to the field. Uh, so good afternoon, Dr. Bruno. Thank you for participating. The screen is now yours. Okay, thank you, Pedro. Uh, can you all hear me? Can you hear me? Yes, we can hear you. Okay, good. I, I, I see myself on the screen, but I, I know that you cannot see me, and I don't like this at all, but I, I hope I still be able to talk a few minutes. Uh, actually, I'm not sure about the time, uh, because the, the, the time of the meeting uh, maybe was scheduled for four to five, and uh, I don't know whether it's appropriate to talk a lot. So I would just like you to make a few comments, a few minutes, uh, maybe five or ten minutes, about some important issues uh, about uh, behavior analysis as an international movement. Um, I really appreciated uh, Professor Pauling's talk. It was a very nice talk. And uh, it is true, of course, that he has a uh, uh, a lot of international exposure. Uh, in my own case, I worked and taught in various countries, and I could compare uh, what's happening now in Europe, in the US, uh, in Mexico, in Brazil, etc. And uh, I'm going to do so by looking at the future of the field. But you cannot speak about the future of the field uh, without speaking speaking and uh, thinking first about the present and the past. And uh, if you look at the past uh, of behavior analysis, uh, it's a complicated past. Um, we would perhaps all like to believe that it's a cumulative field, that everything has been moving smoothly, uh, but it has not been moving smoothly. Uh, when you look at the history of behavior analysis, uh, what I see is a kind of pattern that is called a, a, a kind of saltation. I mean, a kind, it's not a continuous evolution. Uh, you have jumps. For example, Skinner published B of O in 1938, and the book uh, did not sell very well, actually. It sold very few copies. It was until 1950 uh, when Keller and Schoenfeld started to use the book uh, when teaching the rat lab at Columbia University, that the, the book started to sell more. And then, of course, there was the creation of JM in 1958, and then a split in 1968 with Java that, that was created in 1968. So there are splits, uh, divisions, and germs, and periods of change, periods of uh, um, stability, and then more change. Uh, if you look at the history of uh, the experimental analysis of behavior, there have been many changes over the years, and the fact is that not everybody thinks that all of the changes are so great. I'm not going to talk in detail about the matching law, I'm not going to tell about reinforcement schedules, but let me give you two examples of changes uh, that may be controversial. Uh, if you look at SQUAD, for example, in timing research, and then you will see that most of the research that is being done in the field uh, is actually a research that is guided by cognitive models, uh, cognitive models of timing, uh, whether they be set or let or bet or whatever. Uh, this is an example of change within or perhaps outside of behavior analysis that took place in the field. Uh, more recently, uh, there has been many controversies about something called relational frame theory. And uh, whether we agree with RFT or not, uh, the fact remains uh, that most of the people uh, who argue about RFT and who work on RFT and, uh, and act as a therapy, have created a new journal, which is the, uh, the journal of the Association of Contextual Behavioral Science, and it's a split in the field, and just we just don't know very much, I mean, what the future is going to look like. And I'm not going to make predictions about this. What is clear is that there is more stability in, in Java and in the applied field, because regardless of uh, theoretical controversies. Uh, reinforcement works. Uh, nobody said it didn't work, even 
Stephen Guthrie admitted that reinforcement works. But uh, so, so as a result uh, of these procedures, there has been cumulative process uh, progress in the field of applied behavior analysis. And if we look around in the world, we see that uh, applied behavior analysis is, is a movement uh, that has been increasing in scope, uh, increasing in depth, and in participating countries. Uh, for many years, for example, in France, in Europe, uh, behavior analysis was virtually non-existent uh, for complicated reasons. But more recently, uh, there has been some pressure uh, due largely to the parents uh, being better informed uh, toward more behavior analysis. And the European Association for Behavior Analysis has been uh, in increasing in size. Uh, there are now more people doing applied work in France, for example, a lot more in uh, in Sweden, in England, in the United Kingdom, in Italy, in Spain. And I think this is a positive movement. Now, uh, let me give you a few ideas. Uh, to, to I just have a few comments about Brazil in particular, Latin America in, in general, and Brazil in particular. Uh, one of the differences between Brazil and other countries is that for some historical reasons, uh, in Brazil there never was a kind of hegemony as there was a kind of hegemony of psychoanalysis in France, for example. In France, during many, many, many years, I mean, the only way to do clinical research was to be a psychoanalyst. Uh, it's not true anymore, but it was true for a long, long time. Now, when you look at Brazil, there has always been a variety of people, a variety of culture, and it's true in psychology too. Uh, there, has, there has always been a variety of approaches to behavior in psychology. And uh, perhaps because of this reason, uh, behavior analysis has been growing uh, in Brazil steadily, uh, little by little, and there is more variety too within behavior analysis in Brazil than in other countries. Uh, and uh, Brazilian research also has its specificities, for example, work on uh, meta contingencies and, and so on. Okay, so uh, for these reasons and other technical reasons too, for example, in the US it's becoming very, very difficult to work on animals uh, for all sorts of reasons. In Brazil it's not easy, I mean, it's not easy anywhere, but it's easier. Uh, so, because of these reasons, I think that things are going relatively well in Brazil and certainly better than in other countries. So I think, I, I don't make predictions about the future, but uh, about the evolution of behavior analysis, I don't know how things are going to evolve, but I do think, I am pretty sure that if things uh, are going better in, in some place in the world, Brazil is in a good position to be there. Uh, so on, 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 this, on this score, I'm, uh, I'm rather optimistic and I hope things get better and I hope also that uh, there will be more collaborations between Brazil and the US. Okay, just to conclude, okay, thank you. Okay, uh, thank you so much for your talk. After uh, Francois Cugno. Um As Amanda said, uh, if, you, if you have any questions, you know, that, that who's watching this, this webinar, if you have any questions, please send an email to her and we will see if the, this question appears here for our guest speakers. So we're going to select the, the, the questions. So uh, again, thank you for participating, Dr. Cugno. Uh Dr. Dick Malan is now our, our next speaker. Um, he's a professor of Emeritus of Psychology at WNU, and he has conducted research on applied behavior analysis, uh, teaching and mentoring behavior analysis, and organi organizational behavior management. He also created the well-known behavior analysis training system known as BATS, that trained dozens of practitioners and researchers. Uh, good afternoon, Dr. Mola. The screen is now yours. Hi. 
Am I on the screen now? Yes, you are. You're good to go. Or working on it. What do I have to do? What do I have to push? Can you hear me? Are you trying to share content? I'm sorry? Are you trying to share content? No, I'm just trying to share me. Oh, well, we hear you. Go right ahead. Can you see me? Yes. Yeah. Okay. I can't see me. All I can see is the big W, which I think stands for WMU. Okay, cool. Um, I... I know when I'm doing a virtual meeting with my grad students, uh, about half of them are, they confess, about half of them are uh, sitting in their pajama bottoms, which are not obvious until they confess. Uh, I'm curious as to how many of you are working from your pajama bottoms. Um, when I, on the other hand, take this meeting very seriously, I took it so seriously. Well, first of all, let me say that with the uh, virus shut in and so forth, uh, I'm not bathing quite as frequently as I normally do. But for you guys, I, I took it so seriously that I actually took a shower this morning just for you. <laughs> um, I have a few slogans that I kind of live by and like. One of them is save the world with behavior analysis. And, uh, you know, I'm not that presumptuous. I, I know we aren't going to save the world with behavior analysis. And uh, some people more realistically say help the world with behavior analysis. Uh, but that's sort of weak. I, I think uh, uh, save the world kind of punches it up. Uh, so that's the one I stick with. I mean, we're not going to save the world. We're not going to save Berlin and Brazil. We're not going to save Kalamazoo and the United States. Uh, we're not even going to save uh, Federal University of Para in Brazil or Western Michigan University. Um, we're not even going to save our departments. With little luck, we can help all of them. And uh, maybe sort of save you and save me. Um, that's not too presumptuous, I hope. Um, so, again, the slogan that I highly advocate is saving the world's behavior analysis. Um, <clears throat> another concept that I really like is the concept of dream chasers. Um, uh, dream chasers chase unobtainable dreams. Uh, one of my favorite things about our field of behavior analysis is filled with dream chasers, delightfully delusional behavior analysts devoting their lives to chasing. Uh, and my partner, Modico, just broke the screen so I could see how weird I look. But uh, that's the way it goes. Thank you, Modico. Um, <clears throat> So we're chasing the behavior analytic tree and trying to save the world in behavior analysis, or at least some small chunk of the world. Uh, well, trying to help kids on the spectrum learn to talk, uh, to uh, disseminate behavior analytic uh, computer-based instruction through public education, to ending global warming, to infusing the undergrad students with uh, love of behavior analysis, and also to understand what makes us complex organiz organisms and complex social systems work. All the time we do this without forgetting our origins in the Skinner box, our experimental analysis of behavior roots. In other words, uh, we want to find out why the pigeon picks the key and what that has to do with you and me. I hope you know a little poem there. Uh, so you name it, and there's a small or large group of people using behavior analysis to achieve these elusive goals. 
working toward the well-being of humanity. Um, <clears throat> those are dream chasers, and yes, I'm a dream chaser. Proud of it. Okay. Uh, <clears throat> back to saving the world. Um, our WMU sponsor, uh, Anarchy Institute of Global Education, uh, I certainly appreciate their helping with getting this going. Um, and uh, as behavior analysts, we always have very clear objectives as to what our goals are, what it is we're trying to achieve. Uh, and our, we're always trying to change behavior. Um, but I'm not very clear what our goals are. He said, not, not for me. Uh, uh, I don't know what the goals are for WMU and UFTA. Uh, for me, maybe it's just, it's fun. Uh, I would uh, rather spend time personally a week or month, year, at UFPA in Brazil rather than the world's most famous university, Harvard University. It's fun. Uh, if given the offer, I would be there and uh, faster than it takes a WhatsApp message to get from there to here or here to there. Uh, the one condition on which I would uh, be eager to come back uh, to Brazil, however, would be if during that time I could spend a little bit of time in Salvador, which is one of my most favorite cities in the world. Um, and I have the impression that not all of you Brazilian UFPA students have been to Salvador, so please get there check it out. Um, and similarly, your Western Michigan University students in Kalamazoo, there are some other places in the United States to check out. Uh, put on your bucket list San Francisco, New Orleans, and New York City, for sure. And uh, another benefit from uh, people from Kalamazoo coming to uh, work with you guys and study with you guys in uh, a UFPA is we'll learn a concept, WhatsApp. I never heard of that before. I uh, was in Brazil last time, last year. Um, and, but I think we can all make our little contributions to sort of saving the world of behavior analysis. And let's talk about our the chair of this program, Pedro. He, uh, he's not a big time fancy behavior analysis professor. He's a student, he's a doc student uh, from uh, the Department of Behavior Theory and Research at UPFA. And by the way, for you uh, Western Michigan students, uh, there are two separate departments. There is a psychology department and that's probably not where you want to be going. That's not behavior analytic at all. The behavior analytic department is the behavior theory and research department. Um, and Pedro uh, came, got a Fulbright fellowship uh, and came to WMU to work with Cindy Pietrus and that all went really well until the pandemic. Uh, so it was interrupted a little prematurely, but still it was of value. Um, but the interesting thing is, uh, someplace along the line, Pedro talked to uh, the associate pro provost uh, from the Haneke Institute for Global Education, who introduced uh, this webinar earlier, uh, of how, and, uh, he suggested it would be nice if our two departments and the two universities got together somehow. And uh, then uh, Provost Pedro came up with uh, the idea of doing 
these webinars. So there's, uh, he's got four in mind, I believe, uh, for, for four different departments in the two universities. And uh, our behavior analysis program in psychology is the first one. Uh, and well, once that got rolling, Pedro has uh, done a lot of the arrangements. Uh, and uh, is doing an excellent job you know, running this webinar, uh, but still just a student, and he's having an, having an impact. Uh, but the uh, webinar will really only be significant if it gets results, and I would like to talk a little bit about that. Uh, get my notes in order. Um, Still working on getting my notes in order. Okay, so uh, polling kind of uh, alluded to alluded to this. Funding is always a question, but uh, funding exists. Uh, Pedro got a Fulbright fellowship to come to Western, uh, and uh, the Haneke Institute at our university. Uh, is so serious that they have hired Amanda Farias uh, working full time in Brazil to facilitate the interaction between the two universities. Uh, and I believe there is also, so she is the Brazilian liaison officer. That's her job full time. She lives in Brazil doing it. Um, and they want to exchange researchers and students between the two universities. Now, talking to the students, uh, the Haneke, well, there are many scholarships and grants, many sources of funding, and check this out. The Haneke Institute has $500,000 a year that it spends on grants, scholarships for students to do various international courses and projects, uh, not just in Brazil, but around the world. Uh, so you uh, Western Kalamazoo students, go check it out, see what's available. And uh, if it'll be, it'll enrich your life greatly. Um, <clears throat> Then the other thing I've mentioned Pedro got is Fulbright Fellowships. And there are Fulbright Fellowships. Uh, he came here you know, to Western Hall with a Fulbright Fellowship. And there's uh, arrangements now for you to get Fulbright Fellowships for both of your students at Western at our university and to go to Brazil. Uh, <clears throat> and uh, I think that they're talking about having a specific award in psychology. Um, so <clears throat> grab a fellowship and get down to UFPA. But after the pandemic, during the pandemic, uh, the Haneke Institute is doing a sort of a virtual thing. So you're going to learn and interact and enjoy with the global scene. Uh, and uh, get ready for when the pandemic is over so that you can actually get down there in reality. That would be fantastic. Um, we want to spend a few months in another country uh, for academic reasons or not. Uh, but the academic reason can be just an excuse. But uh, uh, get down here, get down there. And similarly, Kalamazoo, a fantastic place. Those of you in Brazil have probably never had the opportunity to spend um, a, a couple months uh, while it's snowing on you all the time. Interesting experience, uh, at least once. Um, <clears throat> Another source of funding, uh, 
once you have a bachelor's degree or a master's degree or a PhD or even later, is to, if, if you're from the United States, is to join the Peace Corps for a couple of years. There have been several uh, alumni who have done that uh, from our program, and it's a very valuable experience. I don't know if Peace Corps is still going to Brazil. They used to. Um, <clears throat> Um, but I, I am not sure about that. Um, but again, after the pandemic, uh, check out the Peace Corps. Great opportunity for international experiences. Um, and Brazil uh, is very strong in behavior analysis. Uh, in fact, it's uh, second only the United States in terms of the number of behavior analysts uh, that they have. And there are like 4,000 behavior analysts in Brazil. And how did that happen? Well, I think a gringo by the name of Fred Keller, uh, I know that all most few Brazilians know him very well, uh, back in the 1960s, uh, went to Sao Paulo and then helped uh, start the program at Brasilia, just as Brasilia was being created. And I think uh, Fred Keller from Columbia University in the United States uh, played a major role. Uh, <clears throat> now, again, I know both Dick Malott and Al Poling combined together with their best efforts are no Fred Keller. Uh, nonetheless, we would uh, love to come to Brazil. But Brasilia, Brazil, excuse me, no longer needs any Fred Keller. You're up and running. You're doing fantastically well. Uh, so we would uh, love to just come and do whatever contributions we can make and get whatever benefits we can get. And simply being with you all in Brazil is like a major benefit. Um, let me, uh, I, I never do anything without some kind of visuals, and the visual of me, uh, Modico is assuring me, isn't all that good. Uh, so give me a second here. Um, see if I can get a visual together. Um, I like books, I like articles as means of communication, as means of getting information out. But um, what I really like is t-shirts. And so I would like to show you some t-shirts. Give me a second now. Share the screen. I want to share the photos. Okay. Still working on it. And something tells me you can't see the photos. Is that correct? Yes, we are seeing the photo. You see that the, they're taking over the screen? Yes, they are. Okay. So one of the benefits of coming to, uh, uh, from, from Kalamazoo to Brazil is they've got t-shirts. Uh, check out their t-shirts. And handy bags. Uh, similarly, if you come from Brazil to Kalamazoo and you from Kalamazoo to Brazil, then you can wear your Kalamazoo t-shirts as well. If you come from Brazil to Kalamazoo, you can check out at our t-shirts. Uh, I, I'm not so sure. I'm looking at Modico's screen. I don't think she so all she sees is me. She does. She doesn't see the uh, on YouTube. She doesn't see the slideshow. I think they're showing up on YouTube. I can see them. 
Okay. Might be nice to confirm that. Modico can't, she still just sees me. Um, anyhow, here are some t-shirts from, uh, from Kalamazoo. former graduate students in the behavior analysis training system with our official t-shirt, Kelly Kohler. I wanted to show that there are occasionally guys in our program. Modico, behavior analysis, organizational behavior management, and autism. So in conclusion, I think uh, it'd be great if you guys join the Dream Chasers team. You become Dream Chasers and continue chasing the dream all your life. Also, it would be great if you become savers of the world with behavior analysis. And uh, I see on Modico's screen now that YouTube photos are sort of coming in, uh, the coming along with the t-shirt photos. In any event, thank you ever so much. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Dr. Malab, for this very interesting talk uh, on the issue of uh, international collaborations. Um, to you, in the, to people in the audience, if you want to ask any questions or you know, to, to Dr. Malak, please, we would refer to Amanda's email. Uh, her email is uh, yeah. on the yeah. of this video. Uh, so let's continue. Now uh, we'll have Dr. Sharon Costa as our next speaker. Um, Dr. Acosta is a professor of organization psychology at the Universidad Federal Bahia. Uh, his work is focused on behavior analysis applied to public organizations, and he has collaborated with several Brazilian and international institutions, such as the Internal Revenue Service, the National Council of Justice, uh, Ministry of Environment, Ministry of Agriculture, Livestock and Supplies, and UNICEF, just to name a few. So, good afternoon, Dr. Costa. Uh, the screen is now yours. Thank you, Pedro. Uh, let's try to do it. Pedro, please tell me if you are watching the, the slides. We can see your slides, yes. Oh, thank you. Uh, so, good afternoon, everyone. Uh, I would like to start my talk by thanking you, Federal University of Pará and West Michigan University, for the opportunity of this webinar. And since we are talking about saving the world, I would like to describe the experience we are having here, trying to do that <laughs> in little steps, step by step, um, uh, trying to, to do a, a better world. Uh, I will describe the experience we are having in using behavior analysis applied to organizations. I coordinate a laboratory of organization behavior management where we uh, have a behavior approach to relevant issues concerning the management of personal and public organizations. Uh, we also provide business constants uh, to public institutions uh, on the same topic. Um, in, in accordance with Brazilian law, uh, federal agencies must establish the ideal profile of civil, serv civil servants for
for each book administration job description. Uh, the, lab, the, laboratory, uh, the laboratory was created in 2011 with this goal. So here we have a, a picture of my lab. And in, in the context uh, of formal partnerships between our university and other, other public organizations, the laboratory uh, identifies the expected results in each unit of the given organization. And from that support that point, uh, we define the set of behaviors for all public servants according to the department in which they work. Uh, according to OBM literature, uh, there are many advantages to defining which behavioral sets are expected to be performed by the employees. During my speech, I intend to present the advantages we are already capable to observe uh, during our work. Mm, the first of St. Gans is uh, minimizing ambiguities in decision-making regarding personal management in an organization. Indicators such as responsibility and flexibility are replaced by measurable behavior that increase evaluation accuracy among independent observers. Thus, instead uh, of re referring to generical indicators such as productivity, um, when evaluating a, a given civil server, uh, we encourage the encourage sorry encourage the organization to observe and record behavior. For example, evaluating his ability to complete reports of accounting with a scheduled time. This new performance indicator is built in partnership with the, with the organization uh, using principles of behavior analysis. As it was built with the institution, uh, that is with the participation of, to, uh, of those who actually do the job, it accurately reflects uh, what is expected for, for, from the employee in the unit in which it works and its job description. Mm, behavior performance indicators uh, can also be observed uh, and in, in, in that way uh, can be observed by different individuals. Uh, this keeps um, the evaluation process more objective, more transparent and more impersonal. about the slides a little bit. Um, as we are now clear about what behaviors are expected to, to, to the public servant, the training process becomes more effective. The system develop, uh, uh, developed by the laboratory uh, not only indicates the behaviors are expected uh, of the public servant in the end of the training process, but also indicates uh, which employee must be called as a priority for training actions. Uh, this, uh, this process optimizes the use of public resources in training uh, while meeting the developmental uh, needs of its public servant in a more personalized, personalized way, more personalized way. Uh, in the process of the, uh, of the mission, the admission of new personnel in the public service uh, uh, through public contests uh, also becomes more effective. Uh, the tests that comprise the public contest may assess whether or not the candidates perform the behaviors necessary for their function, and not just if they know how to talk about such behaviors. Come on, come on, come on. Mm, decisions where a given public servant will be allocated 
can also be made according to behaviors in performance. Since each organization unit now has a list of expected behaviors, it becomes simpler to decide where a public servant should be allocated. As the entire process of identifying such behaviors is done by aligning them with the institution, the institution goals, we align the align every behavior with the institution goals. Uh, it is possible to determine uh, with reasonable accuracy how many servers are needed to reach the unit's expectations. Finally, we can now identify which organization variables may be affecting the desired performance. The laboratory conducts several smaller research projects to this end. Um, they range from project, projects on the role of the frequency and the way in which feedback is provided, um, projects about clarity of the task, and performance consequences. And the, in the end, the management, the management training. We have already helped more than 38 public organizations identifying the competences, that is, the expected organizational behavior of approximately uh, 41,000 civil servants until now. At the same time, we engage undergraduate, master, and doctoral students so they can uh, develop their research work. And uh, at the same time, we also publish articles reporting our, our experience in controlling variables and evaluating new methods. Uh, through the past years, we have become a reference in this type of work, including advising international bodies such as BRICS and UNICEF. The laboratory data show by itself that behavior analysis can still uh, has a lot to contribute uh, to contribute to organizations. Thank you. Wow, I got it. Oh, I can finish this now. Okay. Got it. Okay, uh, thank you so much, Dr. Costa, for your talk. Um, any questions directed to Dr. Costa, uh, you can reach out to Amanda's email that is in the description of this video. Um, and then she will, will uh, uh, forward me the, the questions and then I can present them to our speakers. So, uh, uh, thank you again, Dr. Costa, for your presentation. And now we will turn to the questions from the audience. Uh, so far, we, we received some questions that I would like to, sh to share with you. And those questions are not, uh, were not directed to any uh, speaker in specific. So I guess we, I can present the question to you. And, and then uh, uh, the speakers can, can talk about it. Uh, so the first question uh, goes like this. Um, Professor Dr. Paul Pauling talked about how collaborating with non-behavior analysts has been enriching his career. Uh, nowadays, it would not be a stretch to say that behavior analysts still have the train of being a hermetic community, despite the recent success in applied science, mainly in early behavior observation. Um, so how can behavior analysts better better prepare to reach other audiences in and outside of academia? This question was made by Abraham Melo, who's a student here at the uh, Universidade Federal do Pará. I, I 
think he, his question was uh, was directed to, to Dr. Poland at first. Well, there's no pat answer uh, that I see, but my thought is one certainly can train outside behavior analysis. You know, it's a difficult discipline, but it's not terribly difficult. And if one applies oneself, one can gain expertise in more than one area, or if not expertise, at least sufficient familiarity to interact profitably with people. So I think you know, a broad education and an ongoing education is critical. I'm an old man. But every day I try to learn something new. I, I learn from people. You know, I, I think that that's key. I think not being dogmatic is important. Uh, to look at what people were doing, not necessarily the, the words they use to describe those operations. Uh, I've done a lot of work with animal trainers. And most of them don't use the term reinforcement. Uh, they don't talk about discriminative stimuli. But they're really good at using reinforcement and establishing discriminative stimuli. And if I realize that, and if I pay attention to their methods, not their words, we can work together. If I constantly correct them, that accomplishes nothing. So I think not getting too caught up in words, philosophy, and so forth, that helps. And finally, uh, trying to sort out what you have to contribute. You know, on some projects, a behavior analyst rightly serves uh, the role of leader. Other times, their contribution may be small, but invaluable. You know, there there are some things you know, I just can't do. I don't have I don't have the knowledge. I can't acquire the knowledge. It, 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 I don't have the the time or the ability, but I can see some some little kernel of a contribution I can make, and I try to do that. So I think it's important to to always keep one's eyes open for opportunities. Even if they're small opportunities, they can still be good ones. So those are the things that, that I've tried to do. And I said the last thing was finally, but I'll add a second finally. Be aware of your audience. You know, over the years, I've had the good fortune to publish papers in a lot of different journals. And you just have to, to look at the words that other people use and borrow those words. And sometimes you might have to hold your nose. You know, they're not behavior analytic terms. Sometimes they're enlisted. But I'm willing to sell out if it lets me influence people who are doing important things. Now, that to me is more important. So so being more than a behavior analyst and sometimes less than a behavior analyst. You know, on the one hand, having a broader set of skills and on the other hand, not insisting on some of the conventions that uh, define at least certain individuals in our field. Uh, th those are the things I've tried to do. And sometimes it doesn't work. You know, you, I at least can't work with everybody, but I have found I can work with some people that I thought at first I could, you know, kind of bide my time and, and sort things out, and it often works. And, and if I couldn't work with people, I just realized that, no hard feelings, you know. You do something else, I'll do something else. That's fine. But, but that's my thought. Thank you. Uh, thank you for your answer, Dr. Poli. Uh, uh, does any other uh, of our guest speakers would like to? to talk about the same topic? Yes, uh, I have one comment, a broad comment. Uh, behavior analysts should not forget that it is possible to have great collaborations with people outside of psychology. And I'm thinking of 
physics, biology, and geography, for example. Okay, uh, uh, thank you for your, your uh, comments, Dr. Uh, Tuno. Um, we, we still have uh, more more discussion, more collaborations for this topic in specific from our speakers. So I will uh, move on to the to the next question, um, and th this question uh, was uh, uh, directed to Dr. Uh, Malal and Dr. Costa. Uh, the question is, um, how can behavior analysis help to predict the political and educational behavior after the pandemics? <laughs> Let me go second while I try to figure out. Uh, I think, uh, in, on one hand, the best predictor of future behavior is past behavior. Uh, so look at past behavior to see what, what's going to be happening in the future. And uh, the other best predictor, I guess, is what are the behavioral contingencies that are going to be in place. Uh, and uh, again, that's pretty hard to predict, but uh, I have a feeling that eventually it may be much for the better. I think that uh, uh, we're going to have many more webinars like this one, and they can be all just in your home city or they can be international. Uh, so I think, uh, uh, for example, I'm in touch with uh, uh, a lot of my, a uh, number of my uh, alumni that are on other, you know, are a thousand miles away and we're doing little uh, Zoom meetings and I'm having Zoom meetings with you guys in Brazil. Uh, and that wouldn't have happened. Uh, without the pandemic, um, I have a feeling that university instruction is going to be much different, uh, and, and I think maybe for the better, uh, there's going to be more effective, better developed online instruction is my guess. Just a few thoughts. I believe also that our studies about uh, self-control, uh, mainly uh, about consequences in the future, uh, are very important to to make some decisions about uh, political stuff. Uh, many people uh, take uh, his decisions um, based in uh, the immediate consequences. And uh, that's the main problem of some social politics and uh, social rules. Uh, social rules, if you can uh, think about, uh, are uh, ways to, to, to live together, but it's not the, would be the, not the best way. Is the best way for we live together. Uh, could be, could be not the best way for me. So um, the studies that behavior analysis, um, behavior analysis develop every day about uh, future consequences. It's important for us to talk about uh, uh, political decisions. Uh, okay, uh, any, any other uh, of 
our guests would like to comment on that topic about um, the, how how could behavior analysis help to predict the political and the educational behavior uh, for the pandemics. Um, so uh, I will go to the third to uh, the third question that we we got here, and the question is, um, how do you see a collaboration with Mexico? Um, any important developments? Uh, I think that the, this question was uh, that directed to to all speakers. Uh, actually, it was directed to Dr. Mala. Uh, how do you see the collaboration with Mexico? Any important development? And we know that Mexico has a also a strong uh, behavioral or uh, strong uh, strong community of behavioral sciences. Uh, I I don't know what's happening these days. Um, we over the back in the in the good old days, uh, thirty or forty years ago, we had a number of uh, graduate students from Mexico, and uh, for reasons that are not clear to me. Uh, we have not had many students from Mexico in recent years. Uh, and uh, in truth, I have not. I've been to Peru professionally more than, uh, excuse me, Brazil. Sorry. I've been to Brazil professionally uh, more than Mexico recently. Uh, we did have a, a doctoral student who actually an MD who got his PhD in behavior analysis. He was a medical doctor, a psychiatrist, I think, and he got his PhD in behavior analysis a few years ago. So there is some col uh, collaboration of that sort. It'd be nice if there were more. Okay, uh, thank you for your answer, Dr. Malak. Um, so now we are, we are out of, of questions from the audience. Um, I would like to I would like to thank each of our guests again, and, and I would like to give some uh, some minutes to each of them to to um, present some concluding remarks to our uh, webinar. So I would like to to start with Dr. Paul. And uh, with some uh, concluding remarks, and then we go to Dr. Pino, Dr. Mala, and Dr. Costa. Well, thank you. Uh, the most important remark I can make is I'm really heartened by what I've heard from my colleagues. Uh, the other three speakers. Uh, did a great job. I mean, it's clear that there are good behavior analysts, people who are competent in our field, but moreover, there are people of goodwill. Uh, these days, there is so much animosity in the world, people separating. Well, you're not like me, so I have uh, nothing to give you except trouble. None of that spirit's here. People are talking about how to make things better. Realism, of course, was endemic. It's not easy. And we're beset by horrific problems, problems that, so far as I can tell, are unprecedented in the history of humanity. But nonetheless, there are people out there who are working to, to make things better. Like, uh, Dick Malott says, we won't save the world. We don't need to save the world. The world will go on. What we need to do is to uh, make it a place that is suitable for humanity. Humanity in every form, people across the world. And if every behavior analyst takes a little step in that direction, I don't know how far it will go. But each day will be better than the day before. So, you know, that that's my concluding remark. I mean, 
go out there and do your best. You know, don't stay at home. Go see the world. You only live once, and who knows for how long. <laughs> now that I'm a high-risk <laughs> coronavirus person, it may be next week. But seriously, I mean, give it a go. There are welcoming people. Just go find them. And I hope I'm one of them. Well, thank you. Uh, oh, okay, uh, it seems we are, unfortunately, we are out of time. So uh, I would like there to be uh, more time for our speaker to, to present some concluding remarks, but it seems like we reached a uh, uh, time limit. So thank you again for your participation in this webinar. I, um, I expect that this event brings a lot of collaboration in the future to the, the Brazil and the United States. So I would like to uh, give the screen to the Western Michigan University and Universidade Federal do Pará International Office Representatives. Thank you for your attention. Yes, uh, on behalf of Professor Carlos Agalo Dinamo, I also thank you all for your amazing presentations and comments and great questions. We all hope this webinar uh, gives us more opportunities to talk and share with Federal University of Pará. And um, if we have any questions addressed, I will be glad to share with you all when you be in touch with all the participants who wanted to talk to you. And once again, thank you very much, all professors, Pedro, Federal University of Pará, and Professora uh, Maria Amélia and Professora Maria. Thank you all, and I hope you enjoy this time as much as we do. Thank you, thank you all. Thank you, Bolin. Thank you, Malas, Pedro, Amanda. Thank you very much. Thank you all. This has been really nice. Appreciate it very much. Yes, thank you. It was a pleasure. It was a delight. <laughs>